Now that you know the software basics of working with high-speed video, I'll show you some tips for working with the hardware as well. Let's take a look at my Raspberry Pi camera collection. So here's my collection of Raspberry Pi cameras. In this description, I'm going to label the cameras A, B, C, and D. This is just an arbitrary set of labels so I can refer to them later for consistency. This here is the $6 V1 camera from eBay. Note that this version comes with the PCB backing and the ribbon cable that plugs into the actual Pi. And here is an example of what one of the listings looks like for these cameras on eBay. This is the V2 camera that I bought from DigiKey. This one came exactly as shown here with the PCB backing. And here's an example of what that listing looks like on DigiKey. This one here is another camera that I bought off eBay. Unlike the other one, this is a V2 camera. And also unlike the other one, this one did not come with the PCB backing. As most of you probably know, the Chinese listings for parts don't usually come with very good descriptions. So when I bought this, I didn't even know if the PCB backing would come with it. Here's an example of what that listing looked like when I bought it. Another couple of differences with this camera is that the focus is actually adjustable. So you can turn this part of it to change the focus. Another difference with this camera is the angle of the lens is much wider. So you're going to capture a much wider area in your shots. Technically, you can adjust the focus of all these other cameras, but it's quite difficult. If you look closely at this camera, you'll notice that the area around the lens is all chewed up. In order to adjust the focus on these cameras, I have to rotate a small piece of plastic with a pair of tweezers. It's really, really not ideal. And here's another camera that I bought off eBay. Here's what the listing for this one looked like. Now I'll show you some example pictures that were taken with these four cameras. Each of these pictures was taken no more than a few minutes apart from approximately the same angle. Here is a picture from the $6 eBay camera with PCB backing. Here is a picture from the $42 DigiKey camera with PCB backing. Here is a picture from the $20 wide-angle eBay camera with no PCB backing. And here is a picture from the $15 eBay camera with no PCB backing. When I bought this camera, I actually thought I was buying one of the back PCBs for the V2 camera, but this showed up instead. As I mentioned, most of these cheap eBay listings are really difficult to figure out. In case you're not aware, it's useful to know that you can actually remove this front part of the camera from the back PCB. This is useful to know because if you buy a separate module with a wider angle lens like I did off eBay, and you don't have a back PCB, you can simply pop off this one and attach the new one directly onto the board. To remove the camera from the PCB, the method I use is simply go to the bottom of it and try to lift it up a little bit with your fingernail. It should pop out without much effort. Once you've got it started, you can probably just remove it directly. This group of cameras over here is all the version 2 cameras. All of these will fit onto this PCB. Version 1 cameras will not fit onto the version 2 PCB because the number of pins doesn't match up. If you want to adjust the focus of these cameras, you can do so by grabbing onto the inner plastic part of these lenses and rotating it. The inner part of the lens where I'm rubbing the tweezers right now is a screw-like insertion that can be screwed all the way out if you're not careful. You can screw the lens out toward you to focus on close objects, or you can screw it in tighter to focus on objects that are far away. Also, I'm pretty sure that the people who designed these lenses never intended for the end users to be able to refocus them. This is because the first time you adjust the focus, you'll actually have to break a small plastic bond. Let's try and demonstrate this right now by turning the lens counterclockwise. As you can see, I scratched this one up pretty bad before I actually got it rotated. I've had better luck in the past by removing this adhesive strip and fixing it to the back of the PCB. In order to make the lens adjustment easier, Adafruit sells a small plastic adapter that claims to be able to do this. I haven't tested this part myself, but the product information looks convincing enough for me. It's also useful to know that you can replace the ribbon cables on these cameras with either shorter or longer ones. If you pull back on this black piece, you'll find that it moves and allows you to take out the ribbon cable. Here is an eBay listing that shows the different lengths of camera cables that you can buy. As you can see, you can buy anywhere from 15 centimeter to 100 centimeter cables. Now that you know more about working with the hardware, let's go back and review more of the software limitations of high-speed video. First, let's discuss a bit about the significance of recording directly to RAM disk instead of flash or hard disk. The instructions in this guide make repeated references to the directory dev shm, 
This directory is different from most others on your system, since it stores information directly in RAM without writing anything to disk. Since writing to memory is faster than writing to any kind of disk, this removes one of the bottlenecks that would otherwise limit the maximum frame rate that we could record at. Let's do a quick experiment with the dd command to test the difference in writing speed for a 100 megabyte file to the home directory, which writes to flash storage, compared against that of writing to dev shm, which will write to RAM. As you can see, writing to dev shm is 10 times faster than writing to flash. Although writing directly to memory is faster, it's also the case that you'll run out of it faster. Let's demonstrate this by trying to do a capture with Raspberry Raw that lasts for 40 seconds on the V2 camera at a resolution of 640 by 128 at 660 frames per second. After the recording is finished, we can use the df command to see that we've used the entire capacity of dev shm. If you look at some of the last files that were written, you can see that they are empty because we completely ran out of space. Since we lost the timestamp metadata, this recording session isn't really useful since we can't account for the odd occurrence of skipped frames and variable frame rate. After removing the files from the previous recording session and trying again with the shorter recording period of 6 seconds, the recording no longer fills up all of free RAM. Let's try this recording again, but this time place the video frames onto flash memory instead of RAM. As you can see, the recording still works, but the timestamp data shows we're missing more frames, so we're not truly getting 660 frames per second. Therefore, in order to get smooth playback in your videos, you should only record frames directly to RAM. Now let's review some of the frame rate limitations that you're likely to experience. On the version 1 camera, up to 660 frames per second is achievable at a resolution of 640 by 64 pixels. It was found that attempting to increase the frame rate to 666 frames per second would cause a failed capture. Observe that after running the Raspberry Raw command, no image frames were recorded. Changing the frame width to be different from 640 was found to cause varied results such as gibberish colors, captures that produced no output frames, or captures that produced output frames but with corrupted timestamp metadata. Let's take a look at several example videos that were recorded on the version 1 camera at various different resolutions and frame rates. Here is the video result when requesting a width of 644 pixels, 641 pixels, 640 pixels, 639 pixels, and 636 pixels. Several values were skipped since they did not produce any output that can be rendered into a video. For the version 1 camera, recording at a resolution of 640 by 128 is possible if the frame rate is decreased to 300 frames per second as demonstrated in this capture. Next, let's review some examples of recording on the version 2 camera. Here is an example video captured at 1007 frames per second at a resolution of 640 by 75 pixels. This is the result from attempting to record at 1007 frames per second at a resolution of 640 by 128. This is the result from attempting to record at 660 frames per second at a resolution of 640 by 128. This is the result from attempting to record at 660 frames per second at a resolution of 640 by 200. As you can see, attempting to record at certain resolutions with Raspberry Raw will produce output videos that are unusable. On the version 2 camera, up to 1007 frames per second is achievable at a resolution of 640 by 75 pixels. Sometimes it is possible for captures above 1007 frames per second to produce meaningful output. However, you will likely observe inconsistent results. For example, it has been observed that two separate recordings with exactly the same frame rate and dimensions may randomly end up looking perfectly fine or contain discolored bands just like the ones shown in this scene. For these unstable frame rates and dimensions, you may find that captures will simply terminate early before the specified recording time is finished. Having said this, 1007 frames per second at 640 by 75 pixels does appear to produce stable results. You may have noticed that there doesn't appear to be a lot of difference in the output video when requesting 107 frames per second versus 660 frames per second. A contributing factor to this is that when requesting 1007 frames per second, the timestamp metadata shows we aren't actually getting 1007 frames per second most of the time. In fact, the frame rate appears to jump back and forth between about 1000 and 500 frames per second, even when recording directly to RAM. This diagram produced by Herman SW shows his analysis into the relationship between the requested recording frame rate and the maximum number of vertical pixels that can be recorded. 
The red line shows the behavior of the version 1 camera, whereas the blue line shows the behavior for the version 2 camera. The x-axis shows the maximum height in pixels of frames that can be recorded at any frame rate. The y-axis shows the corresponding frame rate. The downward sloping trend of this graph shows the relationship that one would expect. That the maximum frame rate we can record at decreases as we request more and more horizontal lines from the camera sensor. The experimentally observed maximum frame rates presented in this video appear to agree with the values shown in this graph.